A reading from the book of Genesis. As dawn was breaking, the angel urged Lot on, saying, On your way, take with you your wife and your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away in the punishment of Sodom. When he hesitated, the men by the Lord's mercy seized his hand and the hands of his wife and his two daughters and led them to a safety outside the city. As soon as they had been brought outside, he was told, flee for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere on the plain. Get off to the hills at once or you will be swept away. O oh, my Lord, Lot replied, you had been so good to me, your servant. To do, to do me great kindness in intervening to save my life. But I cannot flee to the hills to keep the disaster from overtaking me. And so I shall die. Look, this town ahead is near enough to escape to. It is only a small place. Let me flee there. It is a small place, is it not, that my life be saved? Well then, he replied, I will also grant you the favor you now ask. I will not overthrow the town you speak of. Harry, escape there. I cannot do anything until you arrive there. That is why the town is called Soar. The sun was just rising over the earth as Lot arrived in Soar. At the same time, the Lord rained down fire upon Solomon and Gomorrah from the Lord out of heaven. He overthrew those cities and the whole plain, together with the inhabitants of the cities and the produce of the soil. But Lot's wife looked back, and she was turned into a pillar of salt. Early the next morning, Abraham went to the place where he had stood in the Lord's presence. As he looked down toward Solomon and Gomorrah and the whole region of the plain, he saw dense smoke over the land rising like fumes from the furnace. Thus it came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain. He was mindful of Abraham by sending Lot away from the upheaval by which overthrew the cities where Lot has been living. Verbum Domini. O Lord, your mercy is before my eyes. Search me, O Lord, and try me. Test my soul and my heart, for your mercy is before my eyes, and I walk in your truth. O Lord, your mercy is before my eyes. Gather not my soul with those of sinners, nor with bloodthirsty men. On their hands are crimes, and their sight hands are full of bribes. But I walk in integrity, redeem me and have mercy on me. My foot stands on level ground. In the assemblies I will bless the Lord. Dominus. 
nos povis cum. Lexio Sancti Evangelii secundum Mateum. As Jesus got into a boat, his disciples followed him. Suddenly a violent storm came up on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by waves. But he was asleep. They came and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we are perishing. He said to them, Why are you terrified, O you of little faith? Then he got up, rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was great calm. The men were amazed and said, What sort of man is this, whom even the, the winds and the sea obey? Verbum Domini. Although today's gospel does not tell us why Jesus crossed to the other shore, we know from yesterday's gospel that he had a purpose. It went like this. When Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to cross to the other shore. That is yesterday's gospel. The reason why Jesus wanted to cross over is not explicitly given. But if you think of it, it is actually very remarkable. Why would Jesus want to cross the Sea of Galilee and leave so many people behind? Had they not come to listen to him, to be near to him? And has he not on other occasions taken great pity on them and spoken to them at length about the kingdom of God? And has he not on other occasions fed them with five loaves of bread and two fish? Why leave the crowd behind? Doesn't Jesus want people to be with him? The answer is, he does want people to be with him. But Jesus is not looking for popularity or acclaim. He has explained to them, foxes have dens and the birds of the sky have nests. Some people just want to applaud him, staying in their own familiar den or nest, rather than become a disciple. Disciples who are willing to follow him on his course, even if that means that they will have nowhere to rest their head even when the shadow of the cross will fall on their path. This appears to be the reason why Jesus gets into a boat. Crossing the Sea of Galilee forces people to make a choice. And the choice is simple. Stay on land or go with him in the boat. And whatever reason or excuse people may come up with not to follow him, he continues his course. And his path involves the kingdom of God. And that has to have top priority. The disciples are among those who follow him. Will they get to see more of the kingdom of God? Will we see more of it today? They experience the sea suddenly becoming violent and the waves crashing into the boat. There are many puzzling aspects in the description of this crossing of the sea. Jesus is asleep. How is that possible? And what's even more astonishing, when the terrified disciples 
wake him up, Jesus says, Why are you terrified, O you of little faith? Is that not a little too hard on them? And what is really shocking is the reaction of the disciples who say, What sort of man is this? Should they not know better than that? How is it possible that they, after having been with Jesus all this time, should not know who he is? Indeed, the Gospel today presents us with puzzles. Let us take these puzzles one by one to see more of the kingdom of God. Beginning with that last puzzle, what sort of man is this? Do we know who Jesus is? How would we answer that question of the disciples? After all, in this liturgy, the word of God now speaks to us. We know that the disciples, except for Judas Iscariot, all followed him till the end and gave their lives for him. We know that. It's not for their sake that the gospel is written, but for us and for our salvation. We cannot take a poll here, but I think it is fairly safe to assume that most of us would answer the question immediately by saying, Jesus is the Son of God, and God created everything, so naturally wind and sea obey him. That is, of course, the correct answer, in the sense that it is absolutely true. Jesus is indeed the Son of God, but is it a good answer? Think of this. Today's Gospel reading is not the first page of the Gospel. It is taken from chapter 8 of the Gospel of Matthew. And we have presumably read the first seven chapters and are familiar with it. We have learned about the temptation that Jesus endured and overcame in the desert. We have read the Gospel. We are Christians. And we have been informed that, well, the devil knows the answer to this question. He knew that Jesus was the Son of God. After fasting 40 days and night in the desert, Jesus got hungry, and the devil tempted him by saying, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. We know that, and we know that Jesus is the Son of God. We are knowledgeable on this point. But if we pause a moment and think, it actually means that when we now answer this question of the terrified disciples in the way we just did, we know nothing more than the devil does. And that is not good. If we say that Jesus is the Son of God, our answer is certainly true. But that, if that is all we know about him, it's not good enough. The devil knew that. Demons who are expelled by Jesus know who he is, but it doesn't do them any good. There is more to know. Perhaps the words that Jesus spoke in the boat are not so strange after all. O oh, you of little faith. Perhaps these words apply even to us. Who do we say that he is? And then there is another puzzle. Jesus sleeps while the boat is getting swamped by the waves. Everyone gets wet. How is it possible? 
this puzzle could actually help us to understand better what is going on. I think the best way to understand it is to, to compare it with a situation that is more familiar with us. We have small children here with us. Imagine this. A father with a child on his arm walking in a crowded street. That father has to navigate carefully, not to bump in anyone. He will sweat, but the child will sleep peacefully, knowing that its father is taking care of him. That image, I think, can help us to understand how it is possible that Jesus is peacefully asleep, while the disciples are terrified because the boat is in danger of sinking. Jesus knows that his father is taking care of him. The disciples have to learn to see as Jesus sees, but their faith is still weak and small. They have to grow and to mature. They have to see God as Jesus sees him and to trust him completely. And we, what will increase our faith? What will help us to see everything from the perspective of God? The gospel will do that for us if we read it carefully till the end. This translation says, suddenly a violent storm came upon the sea. A storm. That is what the Gospels of St. Mark, St. Luke and St. John record. But the Gospel of Matthew actually proclaims it with different words. We have to bear in mind that the Gospel was written for us and for our salvation. St. Matthew not only wanted to record an historical event, at the same time, he wants to proclaim who Jesus truly is and help us grow in faith, bring us nearer to the kingdom of God. St. Matthew writes literally, suddenly, there was a shaking upon the sea. The world was shaking. And on the sea, that means waves getting wet. And while the world is shaking, Jesus is asleep. This is all very curious until you read the gospel till the very end. And then you discover that in the Gospel of St. Matthew, the world shakes three times. This shaking on the sea is the first time. The second world-shaking event occurs towards the end, on Calvary, when Jesus dies on the cross, when he enters the sleep of death, the Gospel says, when the centurion and those with him who were keeping watch over him saw the earth quake and what took place, they were terrified and said, truly, this man was God's son. That is the second time the world shook. And the last shaking of the world occurs on the third day when Jesus arose from the sleep of death. The Gospel says, suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descending from heaven came and rolled back the stone. Three times the world shook. When the terrified disciples in the boat ask, what sort of man is he? 
And when we want to answer that question, it is correct to profess that Jesus is the Son of God. But the gospel wants more. It wants to shake us into greater faith. And our answer is not complete until we acknowledge that the Son of God came to suffer, to die, and to rise on the third day to bring about the kingdom of God. In the boat, the disciples have yet to learn and to accept that Jesus is a Messiah very different from what they expected. They expected glory. Disciples have asked him, can we sit at your right and left hand? They expected a king. Even on the very last day when he was with them, on the day of ascension, they asked him, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? It was difficult to grow in faith. When we now celebrate here the Eucharist, we proclaim the death of Jesus. Until he comes again in glory, we proclaim the death of God's Son. Suffering and death are always difficult to face and to accept. The suffering and death of a dear one, someone who is near to us, our own suffering and death. But the gospel today wants us to grow in faith and it reveals, it proclaims that for Jesus, death is a kind of sleep. Jesus himself said so when he referred to the young daughter of Jairus, the head of the synagogue. They had called him. The child had died. And Jesus said, she's asleep. The mourners standing around did not believe him and laughed at him. But for him, death is like sleep. The gospel reveals to us that Jesus is not just crossing the Sea of Galilee. Through the sleep of his death and his awakening of the resurrection, he is crossing over from this world to his Father, creating a pathway for us, inviting us to follow, not to build dens and nests here, but to follow him. May the celebration of the Eucharist strengthen us, increase our faith, so as to see that our suffering, even our death, are now to be seen in the light of salvation. Let us follow him on his way to the Father. Amen. Amen.